Did you ever see that video by Charles and Ray Eames? It's called the the 10 times or 10, 10 by 10. 10 to the power of 10. That's what it's called. 10 to the power of 10 no. video. Uh-uh. It's this um, art video in which they are starting with this couple uh, in Central Park on a on a blanket, zoomed into where they're sitting, and then it zooms out by the power of 10 and by the power of 10 and by the power of 10. And it keeps zooming out and zooming out and zooming out until then you're actually like seeing, you know, first the state, then then the country, then the world, then, then you're pulling out and you're in planets and you're, you're, you're seeing the, the whole cosmos. For some reason, this episode reminds me of that video because it's all about having a bigger perspective on time than what we're used to. Mm. Like not being so caught up in just what's happening this day in the 24-hour news cycle, but like s- scaling back to look at a much, much broader sample. Right. And I talk about this in the episode, but I was recently in Spain and I found myself uh, privileged enough to be in a millennium olive grove where I got to sit with trees that were 2000 years old. Mm. And, you know, there's something about sitting by or being next to trees that are of this age or older that Mm -hmm. it really puts (laughs) your small life in perspective. And it makes you consider the facts that our actions have a longer impact than what we see. And therefore, our motivation and our orientation when we think about our activism or social justice needs to kind of have that long-term view. Mm. We may not be the ones to reap the uh, fruits of what we sow. And in fact, having that kind of orientation may be the right, the right approach to how we act in this world. Yeah, it reminds me of, you know, uh, looking up the, the night sky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm realizing that it's this light from the past that's reaching me here in the now with my kids. Mm -hmm. And that to me is just so inspiring and it changes my concept of of relational time. Right. Without getting too sciencey about it, it is interesting that we have such a sequential view of time when in reality science is telling us that space time is stretchy and it is really relative. And so it, yeah, in, in the conversation, we explore the ways in which the mystics maybe had this intuition mm-hmm. about deep time mm-hmm. in that they talk about the eternality of time and that contemplation helps us touch into that, mm-hmm. right? That kind of deep relationship to time and maybe helps us live from a different orientation than our own desired outcomes and the timelines that we want them but rather to trust in the slow arc of evolution as an expression of Christ moving in and manifesting in this world. And I think when we take that deep time approach, we're able to hold on to those values that are more eternal and orient ourselves with those values kind of being that guiding light. We're less tethered to the outcome of of the present. We're less tethered to like what we think should happen when we take that deep time approach as Christ unfolding throughout all of time yeah without it being something that you're just like checking out yes. and not like participating anymore because mm-hmm. that certainly isn't it either so i really appreciate the tension of this i hope you all do too as we explore the universal christ in action in deep time so richard today we want to talk about deep time and how the universal christ is always present and always a part of the evolution evolutionary trajectory of um, our experience here so can you expound on the term deep time? I don't think it's something that is in everyone's lexicon. What no. do we mean by when we say deep time? Well, let me say I'm not sure that I'm the best one to define it. And it is used in different ways, but the best way I can come at it is the recognition that the Greeks found it necessary to have two words for time. Kronos was time as dura- duration sequential time, 10, 10, 30, 11, 12. Then they had another word, kairos. And kairos meant time as significance, time when it comes to a fullness and reveals the meaning of chronos, of chronological time. That's close to what we mean by deep time, a reframed notion And when you fall into deep time, um, it's not, you know, Thursday anymore. It's not um, fall anymore. 
It's the way things always are. It's it's a, a deeper level of experience, a deeper level of truth, a deeper level of your own self and life. And I'm sure others use it in slightly different sense. But um, I'm pretty sure that's what Jesus was trying to point to when he used his metaphor of the reign of God. In the reign of God, in deep time. Just put that in there and you'll get it. Well, it's interesting that you say, um, you know, that, that the Kronos and the Kairos definitions of time, it seems to me that mystics um, have had this instinct of eternality. Yes, almost always. Of this greater unfolding. Um, and so you see them talking about it both as a place that we can gain access to experientially in, in contemplation. And now science is helping us understand, not even recently, that this kind of eternal ongoing manifestation is what we can understand as evolution, this, this great creative adventure that we've all been a part mm. of. And I wonder if you could help us understand how does having an appreciation for that evolutionary deep time, that great arc, um, how does that help us have perspective on not needing to have immediate outcomes in oh. our action, but not being passive either. Yep. Isn't that a hard tension to hold? Uh, well, I open to this quote from our wanting um, periodical, the particular issue on evolutionary thinking. And self-centered as I am, I'm going to quote myself. It's, <laughs> <laughs> evolutionary thinking is actually contemplative thinking. Because, and here's the reason it is, because it leaves the full field of the future in God's hands mm. and not controlled by my performance, my uh, contribution, and agrees to humbly hold the present with what it only tentatively knows for sure. That's faith. It's the heart of the matter that I don't have to have a um, totally predictable outcome. Uh, I know that's very hard to live there, especially if you're working on any kind of assembly line, which most businesses are in effect. I've got to do this so she can do that and so forth. And that's kindness to, to be your part of the whole chain. But we've got to know the Christianity that was handed to almost all of us wasn't that way. It was a very static notion of time and therefore transactional. Uh, you just had to know the right buttons to push. And this achieved the right... You didn't have to be a part of an organic movement in your own soul, in the soul of your marriage, your community, anything. It's a different mind, really. So contemplative mind is not just a, a evolutionary mind, but I think it's a, uh, <laughs> I think it's the mind of Christ, which allows the future to show itself, to reveal itself, without the present totally predicting it. You know, I can live without uh, predictability to some degree. We all need some degree of predictability. Living in that in-between uh, could be called evolutionary thinking. I'm not sure if that's what you asked me. Uh, or it could be called deep time. That I'm trusting there's a deeper river flowing. Not much is happening on the upper river. But I still trust the deeper river. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that absolutely is answering the question and helping us see that there's a place where participation, where our creativity meets the, the deeper stream of mm. ongoing creativity of God through evolution, and that there's an active point where we share in the responsibility of moving that river, mm. but that we're not it. It's not just up no. to us, and it's, no. not, 
it's not just up to what we can see as predictable short term. Well, that's better said. Good. Outcomes. Yes. It's holding hands mm. uh, and not taking myself and the perfection of my response too seriously. Mm. It's the communal notion of evil and the communal notion of salvation. Mm-hmm. Mm. It feels like the eternality of now. Where yes, it, yes. Another better way to say it. Yeah. You get it already. Thank you. <laughs> you know, as um, one of the ways that you define resurrection in the universal Christ is you say that's another word for change, which we only see in the long run. In the short term, it looks like death. And this, to me, is a very deep time perspective. Mm-hmm. Um, and so right now, as I look around our culture and uh, our politics, it's easy, easy for me to see the death. It's easy for me to see the pain. And I haven't quite lived into that space of that eternality of now, Mm -hmm. of that bearing witness and the hope of the resurrection. So how do we practice resurrection before it's fully realized? How do we live into that, in that, to your Mm -hmm. point, Brie, of like that space of uh, not becoming passive in the moment, but still hanging on to that hope, but also trying to embody and realize it in this moment? Well, first, it's almost impossible to do unless someone assures you it's true because your cynical voices will win out. I had a woman come to me recently and she said she was an atheist. And I said, now please don't take offense. I'm not trying to define you. But I don't really think you're an atheist. I think you're a cynic. (laughs) Uh, And I think she got it. Um, If you give in to the cynical voices, uh, the cynical voices mistrust the authenticity of everything. It's not. You mistrust the motivations of other people, which is You know, the face you turn toward the self is the face you turn toward the world. And what I hope I was able to help her do was recognize she was very cynical about herself. Mm -hmm. And this utter cynicism about her own motivations, her own uh, intentions. Uh, When nothing means nothing and you're just grabbing at another reason for doing it because yeah. it looks good it makes me rich it it um, will get me sex or whatever you it's not far until you're cynical about all of reality because that's the face you turn toward the self mm-hmm. so what christianity i th- i think hoped to do what jesus hoped to do was give us the announcement of a certain conclusion to shore us up against the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Mm. When the emotional life almost couldn't believe that uh, because life has been so hard. Uh, I I saw that, do you remember a few years ago when they had that picture of uh, the Taliban uh, whacking off the heads Mm. of a whole bunch of Christians from, do you remember? uh, I remember the image. I don't remember where they were Yeah, they were a a Muslim country, but they were Catholic Christians. And these men were all kneeling, you know. Uh, Both they and their families, knowing their head is about to be cut off. What else do you grab onto at that moment? I've got to believe there is a resurrection or this human existence is a huge tragedy Mm. at least for me Mm -hmm. it is Mm -hmm. and how many people have died that way oh Mm. just breaks your heart how many people have died torturous deaths Mm. so the promise of resurrection uh, we need to emphasize the word promise more than the nature of it. I don't know the nature of it. Uh, 
it's certainly not that we're sitting on clouds for all eternity, but something in us lasts forever, and it's the good. Mm. Well, that passage from Philippians, mm. whatever is good. Whatever, goodness is from God, and therefore goodness is eternal. Mm. Everything from God is eternal. Mm. Now that's what's planted in us by the Holy Spirit, and it's really only trials that teach us how to draw from that source. Mm. When, you're, when you have no trials, you live out of your good looks and your money, and why wouldn't you? Or your cynicism, right? You narrow the field yes, to be yes. so small. Very good. Yeah. 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 And it makes sense, too, that we're struggling with despair and cynicism mm. oh. when faced with such levels of tragedy as you're naming and absurdity. And now that we have access in a new way to seeing the tragedy around us through social media, through the internet, the instant quality of us being able to see or witness things that are happening on the other side of the planet can lead to a sense of hopelessness and despair. Yes. yes. And yet, um, you know, that orientation toward resurrection reminds me of a passage that Cynthia Bourgeau, our fellow faculty member here at the CAC, wrote about. And it's worth me reading in its entirety, if you'll bear with me for a second. Hope's home is at the innermost point in us and in all things, she writes. It is a quality of aliveness. It does not come at the end as the feeling that results from a happy outcome. Rather, it lies at the beginning as a pulse of truth that sends us forth. When our innermost being is attuned to this pulse, it will send us forth in hope, regardless of the physical circumstances of our lives. Hope fills us with the strength to stay present, to abide in the flow of mercy no matter what outer storms assail us. It is entered always and only through surrender, that is, through the willingness to let go of everything we are presently clinging to. And yet, when we enter it, it enters us and fills us with its own life, a quiet strength beyond anything we have ever known. Isn't that powerful? Wow. We enter it, the body of hope. Yeah, there's an embodiment to it. It's a... It's something that pre-exists us, and, um, or we fall into it, or we give ourselves to it. It's not we achieve it by gritting our teeth. Mm-hmm. Now, it, it probably demands some kind of decision. I will be hopeful. Uh, yeah, you almost have to see suffering people do it to learn how to do it yourself. Mm. Do it sincerely. You know, I again think of the black spirituals and so many black preachers who had a life 10 times harder than mine. Mm. Where did they get the, the courage, the confidence, the reality check to sing that way and to preach that way and to talk that way? Mm. I almost feel like I don't deserve to talk about it because mm. my life has been so easy compared to theirs. It seems to indicate that hope is a characteristic of of the character of Christ, mm. if I can say it that way. I of know we're, we're talking yes. about, you know, what does the universal Christ look like with flesh on it? And that there's something about hope that is both resilient, not passive, mm-hmm. but that the orientation of hope is open toward not what is, but what could yet be mm-hmm. that does not give up on that spaciousness toward the future. That's that holds enough of a gap for what could be mm-hmm. that even in this, in the midst of something as horrific and oppressive of what is now mm-hmm. that there's still this gap of the future saying, and yet, mm-hmm. but wait, there's more. We called faith, hope, and love the theological virtues. And we were told, this was even in the old Baltimore Catechism, that they are not virtues that are gained just by practice, although that helps. But they are a participation in the very life and nature of God. God is hope. 
God is love. God is faith. And when we live in God, we find ourselves being that way. Mm. Isn't that magnificent? Mm-hmm. No. I think you find that too in, in folks or somewhere there at the end of their tether or in the midst of destruction, and yet there's that seed of hope within yeah. them. And you can, you can it, almost, as Cynthia said, it pulsates in a way where it, people gather around that. I think about what, what can happen after you know, uh, an earthquake or a traumatic event where people gather almost in a spirit of hope and to say that we, we will move forward, we will work together, we will try yes. again. And it, it's that stepping on the gas, hoping mm-hmm. to make it to that, to that gas station, even though you're on E or whatever it looks like. It's just mm-hmm. it's that inching forward at times because you know hopefully you'll you'll get to a sprint or a run eventually. But the best That's you beautiful. can write, do right now is that little small movement with and towards hope. Well, and it also seems to indicate a level of humility that recognizes we're not in this alone. Yes, <laughs> well, again, you know, again, and yeah. how much rationality has flattened yeah. our reality to dismiss, uh, you know, the great cloud mm-hmm. of witnesses or what some have described as the conscious circle, the, the, um, the, the body of Christ of those who have gone beyond that we're still connected to, the ancestors or mm-hmm. angels or, you know. And I wonder, Richard, if you would talk about that. Why do you think that we have lost touch with what is on the other veil or what is beyond the veil of this life and how that might play a role mm and animating our hope of recognizing mm. that, you know, we're not just doing this alone. There's, there, there are spirits, presences um, in the body of Christ, even from those we've mm. lost, that are participating with us. What we used to call the communion of saints. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know, even that phrase was the last phrase added to the Apostles' Creed centuries later, mm. almost as if it took us a while to recognize this communal nature. I'm going to get back to my overly drumming on the issue of individualism. The the individual can't engender a lot of hope when he's suffering a lot and alone. He just, there isn't the willpower in most people. There are those heroic people that seem to be able to rise to the occasion. But when you're beaten down and there's no one to love you, to believe in you, to hope in you, or for you, uh, it's pretty hard to sustain it alone. Mm -hmm. So it's a a commonly shared, uh, well, I don't want to say emotion, because it does, it can't depend upon emotion. It's it's um, being held more than a holding on. Mm. I, I know this must sound like gobbledygook to some people, but I, I ask you to be with it a bit, trust it a bit, especially in the times when when you're not inclined to do so, uh, and then you fake it till you make it. You. Mm. You, you find yourself being there. It's, it's invariably a choice, a decision. Uh, I will live in hope. And eventually, you do live in hope. <laughs> I don't know why that's true. What's the passage of the centurion that says, Lord, I believe, help mm-hmm. my unbelief? Help my unbelief, yeah. yeah. I think that that is, is also applicable it's to hope. It's a lovely, <laughs> yes. I do believe, at least a little bit, but I'm recognizing my unbelief, too. Mm. Yeah, Yeah, that never stops being your prayer. Mm. Another name for everything will continue in a moment. I wonder, Richard, if, could you further expound on how the value of devotion also plays into this? I mean, because mm-hmm. there, there has to be that sense of that sacred heart, that devotion, um, that trust, that trust that I'm a part of this magnificent cloud of witnesses. I'm just on this side of the veil who's trying to participate in this limited linear time that I'm here. But there's this this depth dimension that is the eternal now, 
and I'm participating in that. How does devotion help kind of orientate and guide us uh, in relationship to deep time? You know, I, I can always only speak what just slipped into my mind. I remember when I was still back in Cincinnati, and somebody from some newspaper uh, came to interview me, and uh, we, I was living in a common household at that time of women and children and families, and uh, everybody else was off at work. She was interviewing me in the living room, and uh, she went to the kitchen to maybe make some coffee, or I don't know what it was, while I went upstairs to the bathroom. And uh, I came down, there was a swinging door to the kitchen, and here was this very, uh, you know, well-educated academic lady on her knees in front of the stove. <laughs> She, she thought she was alone, and I had just begun to open the door, and I just was shocked at the beauty of her face and her folded hands uh, and her bowed head, and I shut the door. I don't think she ever knew that I saw her. And I, it, that image of a kind of inner life, inner awareness came into my mind just now of, that's devotion. Mm -hmm. she, this woman clearly knew how to access something beyond. I don't know if we had talked about something especially inspiring or, or what it was, but she came out very fresh and alive, and we continued the interview. Mm -hmm. uh, there almost has to be a secrecy to devotion. Mm -hmm. You know how Jesus says, Pray to your Father in secret. It's probably like the intimacy of a dear sexual moment, not a wild sexual moment, but one that's really tender and affectionate. When you find yourself relating to God that way um, and receiving God that way, tender and affectionate and personal, Hoping, almost hoping nobody sees, because you you, th you know they'll think you're naive, yeah. or not well educated, or what was that? <laughs> you almost got to do it in secret, because the common mind will not normally understand devotion. Mm. It will look like naivete. Yeah, it reminds me of the advice given at the end of the the rites of passage where it's, you know, don't talk about this too quickly. Oh, There's yeah. something about when you try to give words and put a container around a wordless, deep experience, it cheapens it in a way, or it, it doesn't encapsulate enough of the fullness of the experience. And then all of a sudden, it's uh, what you're putting out to the world is a watered-down version of that inner experience. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. How do we orient toward that level of devotion without flattening it into mm. the trite belief of, well, it's in God's hands and, you yeah, know, yeah. <laughs> he's in control. Mm. <laughs> because then I think that that puts us in, in a much more passive, like mm, hands, hands up, like, oh, well, there's nothing mm, I can right. do about mm. this environmental crisis or there's nothing I need to do in this political thing because God knows the outcome already and I can just trust God. So how do we... How do we not flatten it to that level and yet maintain that devotion? What's the distinction there for you, Richard? I'm not sure that I know. I should know the answer to that. Uh, why should I? <laughs> uh, I pretend that I know sometimes when I don't. Uh, but that's that fake it till you make it. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got to hand people that that's a starting point. Mm. So we don't want to belittle it or make fun of it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all in God's hands. I'd almost want to say to that person, if I were their spiritual director, be careful what you just said, because life is going to now make you really live that. Mm. <laughs> mm. um, it, it, yeah, it like takes yeah. us out of a uh -huh. participation in the ongoing incarnation in a way to say, 
which is the mystic who said, I can't believe I'm blanking on this, who said, you are God's, or Teresa, right? Who said, you are Christ's hands. You are oh, Christ's. Yeah. Teresa. Yeah. You are the body of Christ. Yeah. Mm. So if there are needs in the world and you're expecting them to be met somehow passively, um, it does kind of put us in that we are participating in this ongoing manifestation. But I appreciate that you're not just dismissing that perspective, no, Richard, because yeah. I almost want to because yeah. it was what I grew up with. Yes, it's what I but grew up with too. It's I think about my kids as very much what they need right now mm. to feel secure and safe as they need to have an idea that like, okay, God's kind of holding the world or like that Madonna from Montserrat that I visited where she was holding the Christ in the world, you know, in her hands. And there is something about that image that we need to rest in mm -hmm. without completely falling mm -hmm. asleep to mm -hmm. our own role yeah. and post. Because our world is so absurd, right, that we've been talking about, like to have something that holds you, if we are in God's hands, like that could help hold in that container, right? At times when the reality of life, that, that absurdity is just piercing your, your reality and your experience that you can't believe that. And you have to set that aside for a while because it's, your lived experience is in conflict with that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, to hold that in hope that we are still yet all in God's hand mm -hmm. in that bigger picture. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the wrestling of my my day to day with my kids, I feel like, in the world that I feel like we're passing on to them, there's just so much absurdity. Mm. You know, I've looked around at uh, crowds, maybe in a big city, walking down a street and thinking, of course, naturally, well, these are all pagan, secular, unbelieving people. It's just terrible, <laughs> arrogant of me, uh -huh. you know, going about their work, making you fil filthy lucre. Lucre! <laughs> and I know, you know, I know. If we can turn that around, which on occasion I've been able to do, it doesn't matter if they're consciously holding on to God. Mm. God is consciously holding on to them. Mm. That's easier to believe. Mm. It doesn't matter that they don't fully know it yet. They're still a part of the cycle of hope, of life and death. And it makes them holy. You're being, and if, if God, the one who knows all things, can hold on to you, even while you're chasing filthy lucre mm. on Fifth Avenue, who am I to say you're not worth being held on to? Yeah, yeah. Mm. It, it really keeps me from my one judgmentalism. Because mm. um, I know most of my life I ran down streets with my temporary goals. Mm. Uh, um, guiding me, not thinking about God very much, really. Mm -hmm. Well, Richard, recently I was in an olive grove in Spain that had millennium olive trees. And these are old olive trees that have been there for thousands of years. And I got to sit with um, one of the oldest olive trees that they had in that grove, a 2,000-year-old grandmother olive tree. And as I was sitting by this tree trying to take in just the the breadth of time of this being and just to sit and listen in her presence i had this sense of deep grief over mm. the ways that our short-sightedness has created such a damaging urgency mm. of short outcomes that have yielded really really damaging long-term outcomes for our environment and um Paul actually introduced me to this poem by Wendell Berry, the, the Manifesto, the Mad Farmer Liberation Front. And I'd like to just read this opening title. stanza. <laughs> oh, is it good? No. Ask the questions that have no answers. Invest in the millennium. Plant sequoias. Plant sequoias. Say that your main crop is the forest that you did not plant, that you will not live to harvest. Say that the leaves are harvested when they have rotted into the mold. Call that profit. Prophecy such returns. Put your faith in the two inch of hummus that will build under the trees every thousand years. Mm. And that mm. opening imagery of this, and I encourage those of, of you who are listening to read the full poem, but um, this imagery is so powerful for me in the wow. ways that it, it orients us toward deep time. Um, 
So Richard, I'm wondering how you hold the tension of urgent needs of our world that are asking for our real and present action um, as you consider this orientation to Christ's redemptive hummus or hummus of deep time. I'm more and more, the older I get, I'm more forced to think that way. Uh, because I know, I know compared to a lot of people, I've supposedly had a lot of influence. And that feeds my ego. Uh, but I still know that I'm going to pass in a few years and have to let go of my life and my, uh, you know, heritage. That's not the word I wanted. Uh, what, what like legacy or the... Legacy, that's mm -hmm. the word, like everybody else has to do. Uh, and uh, I just have to take satisfaction in the, the present moment, doing it truthfully, which means to do it lovingly. Uh, and almost the more trivial it is, the, the greater the love feels, mm. that it isn't affecting any life, like maybe some of my books have. There I can take a great deal of pride. And I mean pride in the good and the bad sense. But um, to do, I still long to do something purely for love. And I don't know that I have yet. I don't know that I have yet. Purely, 100%. Mm. The only way you can get close to it is if nobody knows and you can't take satisfaction in it because it is so trivial. <laughs> uh, and you know the infusion of love capacity uh, came from another source and you were just the conduit. Is that an answer to what... I don't, Rhea, don't say it is if it isn't. No. Uh, I'm wondering, Richard, with that, would, do you feel like a, an action out of pure love, however small, that you would almost even be conscious of it? Because if it was just love, mm. would you be so removed from the outcome mm. and the desire to know the outcome? You'd be observing it. Yeah. Mm. That would be the subject-object split. It wouldn't be pure participation. Yeah. Mm. Very good. Very well said. Yeah. When it is pure love, you'll almost let it pass by as not one of your creations. Yeah, I almost wonder, you know, yes. when, when you witnessed the, you know, your friend kneeling in prayer, yeah. like if that was, if that's what we do sometimes, we witness one another do these pure acts of love, <coughs> but to actually talk about it might, I don't, I don't want to say tarnish it, but it's, we almost bear don't witness to one another or sneak up on people who are in these pure acts yes. of love. And we, yes. we almost bless them by being like, I am not going to even comment on that because it was just so mm, pure. That's beautiful. You got it. It also makes me think that, you know, the acts, the truest acts of creativity, it, when you are in them fully and you're not in the subject object split, mm. you're also in that deep eternal time. Yes, there, there must yeah. be a yes, connection that's... there between contemplation and that act to be able to say, yeah. In those, in the truest moments of that creative flow, uh, it is a, it's it's touching on that kairos it's, time. It's that all have. the flow of subjectivity mm -hmm. through you, in spite of you, uh, with you, in you, as you. Use mm -hmm. every preposition you <laughs> want, mm -hmm. and that defeats the ego utterly. Mm -hmm. When you know it wasn't self-generated, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you just all you can say. Didn't one of you mention this yesterday? Is thank you, and you're not even sure who you're saying the thank you mm. to. Is it to you? Is it to God? Is it to the free flowing moment? It doesn't matter. Mm. Mm. It's out there in the universe now. Mm. An utterly gratuitous thank you. Mm. Mm. And to me, I wonder about you know that just those two words, plant sequoias. Because not good. You never see a sequoia come to its full no. growth in your own <laughs> no, lifetime you if you're the planter. And it makes you think about that too, Richard. You know, whether it's you or any any one of us, the work that we're doing now, the impacts it's going to have generations down the road. It's 
It's beyond our conception of seeing that work come to its full fruition. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Richard, as we wrap up this conversation on the universal Christ and action in deep time, can you recall a moment in, in the recent days where you were in that Kairos creative flow where your heart was opened and you felt yourself channeling into something that you were maybe participating in that you may not see the outcome of? Because I've fallen so in love with this new little dog <laughs> who's sitting here at my feet, Opie, uh, he's giving me a lot of such moments as your children must do you. That uh, he comes and while well, I'm still, you know, I'm sure your kids do this. While you're still asleep, they come and bother you. And, yeah. <laughs> Every no, night. that's never happened, Richard. I get well, perfect sleep. Well, he does it. He comes licking on my nose. <laughs> and what, uh, or my lips. He's a kisser. I've never seen a dog who's such a kisser. Uh, what a way to start. The flow. Mm. I've just, since I've had him these three months, uh, it's, it's, it's been a better life. Mm. Um, and you know, I said in the Universal Christ book, whatever gets you into, whatever pulls the flow out of you and gets the juice going, it doesn't really matter what it is. Now, it's more wonderful if it's your own child and makes you love that child. But even, if, I have to say it, I know Christians won't like it. Even if it's a piece of art or a piece of music, uh, what, that is Christ for you. Mm-hmm. That is the everything that puts you in the flow. And, and I believe a scientist who's looking at his research or his archaeological study, which gets him all excited about humanity, the future, uh, because of the past. Uh, I believe believe his papers in front of him are at that moment Christ for him. Mm. Mm. And uh, I just have seen those of us who are Christian think it has to have the title Jesus written on it to start the flow. And so often they're not in the flow. Um, so yeah, lately it's been this little one. I turned on the, uh, the dog show on television last night, hoping he'd win best of show. <laughs> uh, the Jack Russell Terrier. You didn't win, I'm sorry to say. Uh, sorry, sorry, Opie. <laughs> but I... Uh, it was uh, on a new level delightful to me. I didn't watch the whole thing, mm-hmm. but how much a certain set of people love dogs. Mm-hmm. They, their whole life is going from dog show to dog show. Now, maybe that, is, I wish they'd go to human show to human show, but if that's what gets their juice flowing, started, God, God's going to use anything. God's going to use everything that keeps you in the caring, believing mode of passion. Kids use this phrase so much today. What are you passionate about? It's almost overused, but it isn't. It's right. What are you passionate about? And I suspect, I have to say, even if it's filthy lucre, uh, I'm doing a radio show tomorrow in Santa Fe, on filthy lucre, on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the spirituality of money. And um, with a man who really believes there has to be a good meaning to capitalism. Mm. And I know he's right. right. There has to be a good, there is a good meaning mm-hmm. to capitalism. And let's agree upon that mm-hmm. instead of dualistically saying it's all filthy lucre. A lot of people are living much more humane lives because of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I read a book when I was a deacon here in 1969 by Joseph Pieper, Leisure, 
the basis of culture. It's still, did you read it in college? Yeah, I, I've heard you reference it and unpack it before, the, yeah. It, I think it's still in print. Now, leisure sounds like something terrible. But if, Only to you yeah, as, yeah, yeah. as a one on the Enneagram. Yeah, yeah a one, and yeah. And German background would For say me, that. For me, it's my whole lifestyle. If there isn't a certain degree of leisure, mm -hmm. most of the beauty of the world could mm -hmm. never have been created. Mm -hmm. Most of the medical breakthroughs, most of the, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, that uh, there's enough, uh, I, I'm trying to use another word than money, there's enough capital, there it is, mm -hmm. there's enough capital to allow me to have some Resources. time off from the survival mode. And, and this should make us care for people who have to live their whole day at the survival mm -hmm. mode. They can't paint Mona Lisa because they have to feed their children. That's some of the evil of it, right. that there's no time to do what you and I have time for. Now I know that can be abused, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. It can be used mm -hmm. instead of abused. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. I, I appreciate the way you're talking about what puts us in the flow. And I, I think another frame for that for me is the delight that we've been talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. and the role of delight, um, mm -hmm. even as you're bringing up leisure. But Teilhard de Chardin said something along the lines of the role of religion is to animate this zest for life, mm -hmm. this zest, wow. that that energy is critical and crucial to evolution and to becoming the body of Christ in this world. And I appreciate, Richard, how you're inviting us to pay attention to where that zest, where that delight is that starts that flow of creativity and love in our lives. Thank you. Amen. Yeah. I'm seeing research scientists often representing that today mm -hmm. give 20 years of their life to one amoeba or something. Mm -hmm. I'm just pe pulling out an example, but um, that's flow. That's caring about humanity. Yeah. 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 Well, should we look at some listener questions? Let's do it. Hi, Father Roar, Bree, and Paul. I hope you're all doing well. Thank you all for what you do. Really appreciate it. My name is Baron. I'm from Oklahoma City, and I'm calling today for advice on finding or connecting Christ uh, in solitude. So I'm working in Nebraska uh, in a fairly isolated town on an isolated project, uh, and will be for the next five months. Um, and with the obvious social strains that I have in comparison to my normal life, um, I was hoping for... Uh, in recognizing that this is a unique spiritual opportunity for some different kind of reflection, uh, contemplation, um, just any advice on how to go as deep as I can with it. Um, I'm fairly new to this. I was only exposed to you all back in May from Pete Holmes episode of his podcast with father Roar. Um, so I'm fair, I, I'm fairly new to just the whole thing of contemplation, but I guess just any advice and, uh, helping a young novice uh, in a spiritual process find some greater depth would be uh, hugely appreciated. So, thank you. Well, you must drive across Kansas, where I was raised, which is certainly food for uh, contemplation since there's not much to look at <laughs> between, between Oklahoma City and Nebraska. Uh, <clears throat> now, seriously, there's... a uh, a loneliness that is of the spirit, a chosen aloneness, which can lead to deep intimacy when you stop fighting it, when you choose it, when, when you uh, recognize the presence inside of things and the voice is coming back to you out of the silence. There's another loneliness that comes from unfinished emotional agendas, relationship uh, feelings and, and conclusions that are still hanging out there unresolved. And uh, that's all you can want to do is resolve that either positive or negative relationship. Um, so that's the first bit of practical advice. 
the fact that you'd ask the question, your voice sounds young. I wish I knew exactly how young you are. But uh, for a, a man that seems fairly young, to already be seeking a meaningful solitude is very impressive in this culture. Uh, I don't know exactly what the solitude is that you're talking about. Is it that you have to live alone? Is that you're out in the fields by yourself or whatever it might be? But you ask the question in a meaningful way. How can I do this in a way that will bear fruit? Uh, you know, I'll pick up a few of Thomas Merton's books. Just look through all of his titles. You can never go wrong with Thomas Merton. But he has a little book on solitude. He has several where silence is in the title. And uh, he just addresses silence as if it's a person. Oh, how I love you, silence. Uh, I myself, and I'm doing this more in my later years, uh, one of the staff members had me over a few nights ago to try to teach me to appreciate rock music more. I, <laughs> I, I, had, I had a hard time with it because all my life, if I have to choose between sound and silence, I'll choose silence. But um, that's really a limiting on my part. And he did give me some wonderful cues on how to let uh, the good music speak to me. So uh, don't hide behind sound, but don't um, feel you need sound to be alive. You can find uh, immense... I'm picturing myself, why did that come to mind? One of the hermitages I did in Arizona. I'm picturing myself walking up and down little hills in Arizona and watching the bunnies and getting pricked by the cactus. And I just remember, this is ecstasy. I just, why would I want anything else than this? I even had my last dog with me on that hermitage and she got covered with little cactus quills and just stood still. She couldn't move. She was in so much pain. Mm -hmm. So I, even there was pain, and yet taking those uh, cactus quills out of her and her inability to whine or to, uh, to complain to me, she just stood still knowing that I would take care of her. Everything becomes a lesson, even the painful. Mm. And you let, in silence, the pain come into your life uh, more. Mm. I don't know why that's true, but you become aware of little snippets of news. If I, I didn't listen to news usually. But if you did hear anything or look at the front page of a newspaper, you would let that touch you because you knew you had time to let that touch you. And everybody else was just rushing by it, perhaps. So silence is a great teacher. As Thomas Keating said, it's God's language and everything else is a poor translation. Good line, huh? Okay, thanks for that, Richard. Here we go. Hi, this is Donna of Missouri. How do you think an absence of wonder and awe and the downplaying of ritual in Western faith traditions might be playing into the avoidance of dying and death? Well, Donna, I bet you're on to something there. That's what first strikes me, that not being practiced in wonder and awe. We're not practiced in reverence and respect before mystery. Mm. And certainly the big mystery is death. What does this mean? What's on the other side of death? If we've avoided that wondrous bow 
before not knowing all of our lives. How will we learn it in the last five hours? I, I, it must be near impossible without the grace of God, of course, who can teach us anything, anytime, and I'm sure is trying to. But if we've created resistance to unknowing, to wonder and awe, we won't allow ourselves to be taught. So, um, and that you brought in the notion of ritual is very good too. Because ritual, if it's done well, it's done slowly with space in between the movements and the actions. So it lets the, uh, the unspoken speak. Uh, and religions without ritual tend to be far too wordy, far too uh, cerebral, far too rational, and far too argumentative. So ritual well done. Now ritual isn't always well done, of course. It often becomes ceremony that is done in a catatonic way. And I say this as a Catholic, where we sort of overdid our rituals in a quick formulaic way that didn't leave room for unknowing at all. It was another transaction. So you're, you're teaching me something there. Thank you, Donna. Hmm. And Richard, do you have any thoughts about how that connects to our fear of death and dying? Or fear. I didn't hear her say that. Sorry. She, she kind of tagged it at the end. No. How does, how does, maybe I'm reframing it wrong, no, but how does the awe and wonder, um, not having rituals that, that help us get into that space, uh, play into our fear of what lies beyond the fold or the veil, I should say? If we don't train ourselves in waiting and hoping and believing, I want you to understand all three of those words in broad ways. Uh, I think we're going to be afraid of most things. <laughs> if we get too used to uh, early resolution, you know, easy resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, rushing to judgment, rushing to closure. Uh, and I'm still doing this at my age. I talk about it better than I do it. But I, I am learning it more and more. I, I made a road trip last week to visit a, a friend who lost uh, two uh, close associates that I happen to know both of them in a short time. And I was just amazed how, um, how I was dealing with irritations of traffic and um, filling the car up with gas one more time. And I don't know, all these usual things that would irritate me on a road trip. It was all just okay. And that was a wonderful gift to me to when I got to this city 14 hours from here, I was able to be present to this friend mm -hmm. in a hard time. But boy, it's taken me all my life to begin to learn that. And uh, yeah. Please add anything that you too would like I, to add. I feel like you're saying it beautifully, that there's something about these rituals and on wonder that open us to mystery and that without that unknowing we can't even we can't welcome resurrection mm. without very good welcoming yes. the dying and yeah, welcoming the letting very go very good and surrendering into what we don't know because mm -hmm. um, resurrection is equally unknown yeah Yes, yes, Yeah, yes. and I, I know I keep bringing her up. I'm kind of on a Beatrice Bruteau rant right now, but <laughs> in one of her books, The Psychic Grid, she says that we have equated certainty with helplessness. In other words, we feel most certain as human beings when somebody tells us 
how things are. We like authority figures to tell us this is this is what's going to happen and this is what it's oh, going to be I like. See the point. Oh. And her point is that oh, no. as a creative community invited to participate in God with God, we have to move out of our addiction to certainty. Mm. And right. I think culturally we've become so obsessed with empirical factual knowing, the way of knowing of academia or scientific um, thought that d- that makes everything into something that can be rationalized. Um, that we've lost myth. We've lost the, the rituals that open us up to wonder and something that is greater than ourselves. Um, so I, I both love the question and I love how you're answering it, Richard. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I wonder if it's a combination of a thor- uh, certainty with authority. This, when an important person tells me this, I'm freed of my anxiety. That's I'm it. Free- yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a, it, it's, it ends up being more authority than certainty. It's mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. a smart person, an older person, a person with the title. Uh, they're allowed to take away my anxiety. And religion does the same thing. Mm-hmm. We've oh, done, I mean, tell me. Right. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I'm a Catholic. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah. I like that maxim of uh, strong opinions held loosely. Where it's like you can have strong opinions, but you're not so attached yeah, that that good. certainty doesn't blind you. Yes. Yeah. Held loosely. Very good. And that's it for today's episode of Another Name for Everything with Richard Rohr. This podcast is produced by the Center for Action and Contemplation. Thanks to the generosity of our donors. The beautiful music you're listening to was brought to you by Will Reagan. If you're enjoying this podcast, consider rating it, writing a review, or sharing it with a friend to help create a bigger and more inclusive community. To learn more about Father Richard and to receive his free daily meditations in your electronic mailbox, visit cac.org. To learn more about the themes of the Universal Christ, visit universalchrist.org. In the high desert of New Mexico, we wish you peace and every good.